Hey everybody, it's Josh with Talk About Trek. I'm back. I've just finished up mere moments ago. DS9 number two, The Siege. The first original novel based on the hit television series. Uh, of course, written by Peter David. Death prowls the passageways of Deep Space Nine. I had a lot of fun with this book. Of course, Peter David has wrote a lot of great Trek books, and I've I think I've liked most of them, or I would say all of them, probably. And uh, probably in my top five, maybe, of authors uh, at this point in time uh, for the Trek books, you know. So I knew going in that I was going to be enjoying this. But what I didn't know was really what I was getting into was kind of a very dark story uh, for your typical Star Trek book, you know. Uh, they are basically tracking down a serial killer. It's a very Odo-centric book. And I kind of like how that came about, too, and we'll get into that more. But uh, Before we do that, let's just go with the, the basic stuff. As you can see, the cover here features Odo, Sisko, and Kira. Kira played a very small part, mainly Odo and Sisko, kind of featured in the book, I would say. <clears throat> From the back. When Deep Space Nine is forced to curtail entry, the wormhole to the wormhole due to increased graviton emissions, an air of biting tension settles over the station. But when this anxiety leads to the merger of an Edaman religious leader, Commander Benjamin Sisko and Security Chief Odo realize they face a larger problem. This missionary is only the first to die. Soon Sisko and Odo have more lifeless bodies on their hands and a killer who strikes without motive. Then both the Edamans and the Cardassians arrive, threatening to destroy the station unless the murder is given to them for retribution. Now, in order to save Deep Space Nine and stop the killing, Odo must try to destroy a powerful assassin who is the only link to his mysterious past. Well, okay, so, not bad. Doesn't give away too much. So, yeah, basically what you have with this book is a, kind of like a, a thriller, you know, like a chase. There's a serial killer loose on Deep Space Nine. They've shut everything down. No one can leave. Odo is on the case trying to track him down. And then you have this additional kind of side story with these uh, prophets or whatever who are coming to preach the word of their god, Kolkor. And they are uh, trying to get to the Gamma Quadrant to do that, but with the wormhole shut down, they're stuck on the station. And they are a bit of a strange bunch. Very tall. I think they're described as being like seven foot tall. And almost looking like um, basically a, a group of Grim Reapers, you know, which is kind of funny because uh, the the blurb on the book or whatever says death prowls the passageways of Deep Space Nine, and yes, there was a murderer aboard, but then also there was this group of people that looked like the Grim Reaper, so kind of like this kind of double double thing there. So how the book came about, pretty interesting story. In January of 93, DS9 just started, and this is from an interview with the author, Peter David, of course, out of the, the giant book about books, which we love. Um, basically, the Pocket Books publisher called him, says, we need a Deep Space Nine book, an original book, and we need it by the end of January, and this was in the middle of January. So he jumped on board, he says that they threw carloads of money at him, more money than he's ever gotten paid for a Star Trek book. Uh, they sent him the scripts, I think the first five episodes, the character Bible, that kind of stuff, and he in two weeks read through all that and wrote this book. And he kind of keyed in on Odo in the book because he kind of felt, I guess he identified, he felt Odo was like a superhero. And that's what he kind of identified and wanted to write and wanted to go with. So that's what made him make an Odo-centric book. And then in the book, he's got Odo doing some things that are different from how Odo is, is later on. You know, specifically in regard to, like, when he changes, uh, does his mass stay the same, uh, how, how does all that work. So that's something that, that he brings in here. And he had a funny response saying that basically... You know, he got Odo right, just the rest of the series got Odo wrong, <laughs> as far as how he works. So, uh, whoops, there we are. Okay, we're over here. Anyway, very interesting book, very dark for a Star Trek book. Again, 
a lot more blood and gore and murder than, than I'm used to, to reading in one of these books. But just all in all, it was a, a good ride, you know. It kept going. It kept the pace up throughout the whole book. The uh, There was a few little side stories that were kind of tossed in with uh, Miles and Keiko and then the uh, Dr. Bashir and his attempt to save this young Ad Damon kid. Uh, which really, I mean, like, kind of was like almost its own kind of separate part of the story, giving this whole moral dilemma, you know, of him wanting to save the life, but, you know, not being allowed to interfere, you know. So that was really good as well. And again, the whole thing just kind of really came to a fun and exciting finish. Uh, and I guess I would say that I like what he did with Odo. And he did make Odo kind of like a superhero in this. And you don't see that too much more in the series where he's not quite as, I don't know, as energetic and, uh, I don't know, crazy in his, his shape-shifting abilities as, as Peter David writes him in this book. So um, just very, very well done, very fun, and glad to just be jumping into new Deep Space Nine stories. So for me, that, that was just the the best part, just getting a new story, getting in there, and uh, looking forward to continuing this, too. I'm definitely going to jump right into... Oh, my God. I don't even have number three. So, anyway, I'm definitely going to jump into something else, but not number three right after this. Uh, we'll sort that out later. So, anyway, if you don't want to be spoiled or anything, you can shuffle off now. I'm just going to kind of give my thoughts on the, the book, uh, some of the main points that happened, and, uh, you know, rant and rave, as we typically do here on this channel. So, you know, I did a decent job on my notes, but then I just stopped. So we're just going to finish the notes here as we're kind of going through it and we're talking. So, uh, starts off with a prologue, a mysterious killer is approaching Deep Space Nine. You don't have much information about what's going on there, but he's coming. He's on the way, right? Uh... O'Brien and Keiko are, well, basically Keiko's not entirely happy to be here on Deep Space Nine. Uh, I do like in this part, in the beginning of the book, the author gives a nice description of the station, of the habitat rings, of kind of the whole thing, so he lays it all out there in the first chapter. So, uh, the other little side story in this book is uh, Miles is always trying to uh, learn and do like a new magic trick, because he's... Uh, with uh, his daughter's third birthday party coming up soon. He's trying to figure out something he can do there for the party. So a few little uh, light moments where he's trying to get Odo to, uh, you know, to his card trick or watch his card trick and all that are thrown in throughout uh, what otherwise is a very kind of deep and dark, you know, Deep Space Nine book. So, okay, so the main kind of, I don't know, starting point of the book is that the wormhole is shut down. Uh, all of a sudden something is going crazy, a bunch of wreckage comes through, turns out it's Borg wreckage, and the wormhole is undergoing what is called subspace compression. And what is that, you may ask? That is nothing but techno babble. Another great thing that I read here in the book about books is that uh, when he had to figure out a way to shut down the wormhole, Peter Daver, Peter Daver, Peter Daver, Peter David called Michael Okuda, who, without missing a beat, told him about subspace compression. What could that be? He told me it was techno babble, and it could be whatever he wanted it to be. So that's what happens. Uh, subspace compression, close the wormhole, nobody can go through. This group of prophets, these Adamians, who worship Kolker, want to get to the Gamma Quadrant. Uh, but once they're shown what happened to the Borg sphere, or cube, uh, they decide they're going to stay on the station until things are a little bit better. So that kind of sets the stage. You have the station full of people, you know there's a murderer coming aboard. And then they also intertwine a little bit of a Quark story. So then you got Quark, and he's... Um, Peter David writes Quark kind of like a real cringy, you know, but that's how kind of like a... Ferengis are, you know, the classic, like, Ferengi cringe, you know? But Worf is a, or Worf, 
Quark is approached by uh, another Ferengi Glav, and apparently he, sometime in the past, he did something to wrong this guy. So he's worried that Glav is coming back for revenge, but really Glav is coming back to let him in on a scheme to buy the buy the state the station from the Federation or from Bezor, who owns it. So just kind of little interesting side stories brought in, and you're left wondering, like, well, you know, where is this going to end? And it also gets kind of really weird, too. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. But So anyway, the first murder happens, and it is uh, the... that one of the disciples of Kolkor, um, not the main guy, the main guy is named Maz Marco, and again, you picture uh, like a, a giant uh, Grim Reaper kind of guy, and... Uh, but this other guy, Lob, who's one of the... Yeah, Lob was murdered. Um, and murdered brutally. Basically, the the murderer is a shapeshifter. And uh, he shapeshifts his hand into, like, a giant hammer and just smashes the guy's head completely. And then, in his blood, writes number one on the wall and escapes. Again, right? Dark for a Star Trek book. You usually don't get you know, quite that much gore. But, uh... So now Odo is on the case, and he is he is upset, to say the least. This does not go down on his station, you know? So he's, they're trying to track this down. They're looking for clues. Uh, of course, no clues left behind. And then they start leading you into, uh, they make you, or he makes you think that the next victim is going to be this little girl. So it's kind of an interesting uh, scene they have there too where the shapeshifter assumes the form of another little girl and becomes friends with this little girl and they start playing and then when her mom comes home then they're assaulted by this Cardassian who, who's on the station and just kind of just out of luck the killer chooses to kill the Cardassian first and then they're you know they're saved so that was again a kind of a dark sequence too because I'm thinking like is he really going to kill this kid? Is that where they're going in this? And no, they, they didn't go there. The kid was fine. Uh, but the Cardassian, uh, the shapeshifter, went into his mouth and then blew him up from the inside out. So again, your second very, very gory death here in the book. And now the uh, Cardassians are involved, of course, because they, they need to know what happened to their man. So uh, Gul Dukat comes to the station. And, of course, Maz Marco, the leader of the, the Disciples of Kolkor, he's upset as well. He wants answers as to what happened to his man, Lob, you know? So now you got these two different parties coming in. And now we have the... Who was the third? The nurse? Oh, no, no. Then And then there was a, a woman killed who was basically like a... Uh, a load master down in the docks. So she was the third victim. She was killed. And then one of Dr. Vasir's own nurses was killed as the fourth victim. And again, no no clues left, nothing like that. But they're able to kind of discern now that they know that they're looking for a shapeshifter from what they've gathered from everybody else, right? So now they start setting up these different plans. They got to figure out a way to shut off the air ducts. So if you try to jump up into there, they can shut them down. And they do, with Miles' help, they, they kind of figure that out. And at this point now, like the station is real, everybody's getting suspicious. Everybody's kind of freaking out. You know, Miles is wanting to walk his, his uh, wife and daughter home every day. He's giving Keiko a phaser just in case, you know, and that comes in handy later. And then, oh, the attempted fourth victim, I should say, was going to be Quark and Glav in a very, very nasty scene. Uh, Quark is basically trying to, like, show off to this Glav, so he shows him one of his uh, X-rated programs featuring Kira and Dax, right? Like, and I think this happened in the series, too, and he caught, like, a lot of crap for it, but just, like, man... That's like the dark side of the hollow deck, right? Like seriously, but during their little excursion here, where they're being terrible, uh, the killer comes in and attempts to kill Quark, 
at the very last moment, luckily, Dr. Bashir uh, busts in, tells Quirk to get out of the way, and Quirk, with his you know Ferengi instincts, immediately dives out of the way and is, is able to escape and not get killed. And then this kind of, I think that's kind of one of the things that maybe sticks in Odo's mind, because he he gets like little bits of information here and there, here and there, and then in the end, it kind of all clicks and he puts it together and he finally figures it out. And uh, so basically how it ends is that they set a trap for the killer where Odo pretends to be Quark and Quark is uh, uh, leaving the station. He's found a way to get off the station around uh, the kind of the quarantine that's going on. And since he's leaving, Glav is trying to leave with him. And then this is when we find out that Glav is the one that hired and brought the shapeshifter on board to kill Quark. But that's not really Quark. It's Odo faking his Quark. You know, he's shapeshifted into a semi-Quark, you know, in the dark. So now you have the great final battle of the uh, of the book, shapeshifter against shapeshifter. Uh, very del- well done there, too. I like that a lot. Uh, just kind of turning into different things, fighting against each other, trying to escape. At one point, the other shapeshifter does get away and escapes to a runabout. Odo gets on the runabout, clings to the front of the runabout, eventually gets inside the runabout. But it's all kind of brought to a close when the runabout is hit by the stray fire between the Cardassians and the Adamians, and Odo and uh, the shapeshifter, who's named Meta, Uh, meta for metamorph, I guess, are left floating in space. And then the shapeshifter meets his end when the wormhole opens up and sucks him in, and still undergoing this terrible subspace compression, uh, basically, like, rips him into a million pieces, but doesn't kill him. So he's, like, forever conscious, but forever formless, drifting in the Gamma Quadrant, which is a pretty dark end for that. uh, He was a serial killer, but still, like, forever floating through space, uh, wanting to die but never dying. You know, that, that's a dark end for that guy. Now, the other story that was going on here, the followers of Kolkor, uh, they're, they're basically the son, the young son, is sick, and he is dying. And he can be cured. Bashir can cure him. But these people's religion says no. They need to just let nature take its course, and if he dies, that's the will of their god, you know? So, Bashir, of course, does not like that. He's against that, and he's trying to do everything he can to save the young uh, Rasa, that's his name, and what he does is, I don't know, again, it's kind of like morally terrible, but maybe right by how his thinking is, but Uh, His mom is going to let him pass, according to their religion. He tricks her into a holodeck so that she has to watch what it's going to look like when her son dies. And then this kind of throws her into such disarray that she then changes her mind about it. And once Maz Marco gets locked up for being an instigator, uh, she takes him to Bashir, who saves his life. But then, when all the book ends and everything's kind of said and done, Maz Marco comes out of, you know, holding, divorces her, disowns his son, and basically, you know, they're, they're like no longer a part of the the followers of Colt Corps. They've walked off the path and they're forever done. And in this religion, in these lifestyle, even he can't remarry. So even, it's not like it's something he wanted to do, it's like something he had to do. So... An interesting moral dilemma there. You know, the doctor tries to save the kid, but at the expense of, you know, going over their religious beliefs. So just, I don't know, a lot of very interesting stuff going on there too. And it it gives you a lot to think about. So I'm going to write that down right here. A lot to think about. And, um... Really, that's what this book did. It gave me a lot to think about. I was kind of, I don't know, 
maybe a little bit put off by the amount of gore, but it wasn't that bad. Um, just not normal for a Trek book. Uh, not normal to have people exploding and all that. But I guess the the real fun of it was Odo and his kind of relentlessness. Rel relentlessness? Yes, okay. He was relentless in his pursuit of this metamorph. And uh, that really drove the book very well, along with Cisco and Miles, I think. Just kind of the three of them together in that order uh, really made this very fun. So uh, just a great book, a lot of fun. But now I don't know what the heck I'm going to do. I don't have number three, and I probably won't be able to get it for a bit. So I guess we will jump off Deep Space Nine and, uh, I don't know, just see where my heart takes me. If you have any suggestions, you guys can give me something. I don't know. Um, yeah, that's all we got for today. We're going to drop it right off here at 21 minutes. As always, everybody, thank you so much for watching. Live long and prosper. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. Oh, my mouse is not cooperating. It's going to stop right there. Bye.